G'day everyone and welcome to this week's episode of the Project 10X Weekly Roundup, where we go through the most interesting crypto tech and finance articles hitting the media in the last week. This week it's all about banking and how the banks feel about crypto and we're going to finish it off with Ray Dalio's letter that he had recently posted. So kicking things off on the geopolitical scale, we've got India to propose a cryptocurrency ban, penalising miners, traders and fining anyone trading in the country or even holding such digital assets. Then you've got their neighbouring Pakistan province planning to build pilot cryptocurrency mining farms. So they're building two hydroelectric powered pilot mining farms to capitalise on a bullish crypto market. They've also formed a federal committee to formulate a new crypto policy, even as neighbouring India is planning to ban cryptocurrencies entirely. So on the one hand, you've got India banning crypto. On the other one, you've got places like Pakistani provinces that are getting into mining crypto. You've got Miami becoming the hub of the cryptocurrency world. You've got other states in the US which are providing electricity tax credits. And I think everyone will jump on the crypto bandwagon eventually, but you're going to continue seeing this until they realize that there's money to be made. Moving on, the Federal Reserve's power says CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, need to coexist with cash. And I wonder why he's saying something like that. And the answer is in this tweet. So the head of the Bank for International Settlements, often called the Central Bank for Central Banks, declares he wants complete control over money by abandoning cash in favour of central bank digital currencies, an openly stated very important goal. So the reason is, if you have $100 and you spend it as a $100 cash bill, they don't know where you've spent that. If you have $100 in CBDC, they know exactly where that $100 came from and where you spent that money. So it's a form of control by understanding where all the money is coming from and going to. And of course, they'd love something like that. Moving on, you've got Bank of America. One analyst slams Bitcoin. Buying one BTC is like owning 60 cars. So the Bank of America analyst, Francisco Blanche, has slammed Bitcoin as exceptionally volatile, impractical and environmentally disastrous asset that's useless as a store of wealth or an inflation hedge. Now they're starting to say things like that, which means they're spreading fear, uncertainty and doubt. And it also gives me a feeling that they're starting to get scared by the cryptocurrency market in general um, and Bitcoin obviously as the biggest leader in the market. Next, on the other side of the scale, so you've got Bank of America spreading this fear, uncertainty and doubt. And then you've got Morgan Stanley becoming the first big US bank to offer its wealthy clients access to Bitcoin funds. So the two funds are from Galaxy Digital and there's one from Nindig, but you're seeing the difference between the banks here. So Morgan Stanley is offering crypto custody. And the reason is their high net worth individuals will just go to somewhere like Coinbase. And I'm sure their high net worth individuals have probably gone to Coinbase, bought a million dollars worth of Bitcoin and said, hey, Morgan Stanley, just letting you know, I've bought a million dollars in in uh, Bitcoin, why aren't you allowing me to do it through your you know, portfolio? So now Morgan Stanley's come back and said, well, you know what, you can do it with us because they, we're gonna manage your portfolio. And remember, if you buy a million dollars and Morgan Stanley is managing your portfolio and they collect 2% per year, that's $20,000 in additional income for them. So why wouldn't they offer their wealthy clients access to Bitcoin? They've gone one step further and are rumoured to be eyeing a stake in a top Korean exchange, BitThumb. So they're rumoured to be negotiating the acquisition of a significant share of the exchange and are planning to invest between $254 million and $441 million because exchanges make money, right? We all know that Coinbase is making an absolute killing and they're about to go public or they have just recently gone public. And uh, they're making over a million dollars a day. So of course you're going to want an exchange. And then you've got another bank saying, Bitcoin is too important to ignore, Deutsche Bank report, because it is a $1 trillion market cap, according to their report. They're also saying things like, they estimate that less than 30% of the transactional activity in Bitcoin is related to payments. And that is because people are holding Bitcoin, they're not transacting with Bitcoin. And the reason is because Bitcoin appreciates at 200% per year. So 
you're better off holding it than actually selling it for a piece of chewing gum or whatever it might be. And then also you've got Bank of America sees DeFi potentially more disruptive than Bitcoin. And I think they're onto something here in terms of disruption, but not more disruptive than Bitcoin. The bank also calls central bank digital currencies kryptonite for crypto, but it is intrigued by DeFi, which it says is potentially more disruptive than Bitcoin. So I think CBDCs cannot compete with Bitcoin or crypto in general. So CBDCs will be the equivalent, right? So if you have an AUD coin, which is a central bank digital currency coin, and you have an AUD, they're going to be the same thing, right? It's just a digital dollar. However, they can print that dollar into oblivion, which is what we're seeing now. You're just seeing a lot of money printing going on all over the world. So Bitcoin having a fixed supply, you can't even compete with that because that's a fixed supply versus an unlimited supply. So this kryptonite for crypto, I don't buy a thing of it. Moving on, this is an awesome one. This casino in, in Decentraland is hiring for real. So you've got real life hosts that now work the floor at Decentral Games Casino, helping newcomers to this crypto house a chance try their hand at digital roulette, blackjack and slots. For four hours each day, the greeters staff shifts in the metaverse. Then at the end of the month, they get paid upwards of $500 in die or about 500 US dollars or the firm's DG token. For those that don't know what the casino looks like, it is uh, here. And what you see is there's people logged in digitally at the casino, you know, in this metaverse, they're uh, gambling and they're making bank and losing money and doing all the rest of it. But at least now you've got real people that are greeting you. Moving on, Chinese tech firm Meitu buys 49 million more in Bitcoin and Ethereum. So Raul Pal has spoken to us before about the fact that Ethereum is on the same trajectory as Bitcoin. It's just five or six years behind Bitcoin because it is five or six years younger than Bitcoin. So now you're starting to see the first publicly listed companies start to dabble in first Bitcoin and that then move on to Ethereum. And now you're seeing that here, right? So you're going to get more of these companies start to dabble in Ethereum as well, which is super bullish, not only for Bitcoin, but Ethereum as well. You've got another company from Norway, Acker, to put 100% Bitcoin in treasury reserves of the new, their new investment unit. And it's owned by a billionaire and the firm's new investment entity, CT, is going all in on Bitcoin. So we're starting to see things like this happening every single day. For our Aussie listeners, Crypto.com is expanding their payment card to Australia after becoming the Visa principal member. So their card allows users to convert their crypto into fiat for spending at Visa accepting retailers, of which there are 70 million worldwide. Also on Thursday, the company said it will introduce fiat currency lending backed by crypto collateral. So not only can you spend your cryptocurrencies, using your Visa card, you can also borrow against your cryptocurrencies. Therefore, you make banks useless. Moving on, artists report discovering their work is being stolen and sold as NFTs. The article says while NFT investment gold rush has made some artists millionaires, it also appears to have drawn bad actors looking to cash in on the work of others. Many artists around the world are reporting their work has been stolen and sold on NFT sites without their knowledge or permission. Remember, when someone makes like or mints an NFT, the token they create is permanently tied to a unique digital or physical asset. That asset can be a pair of shoes or it could be a URL, a video, a JPEG file, a picture. So when someone buys an NFT for a digital artwork, they're not buying the artwork, but the token that represents the artwork. That artwork could have come from anywhere. So this is something to be wary about and something that we should uh, continue to follow. Then the, some exciting news from Commonwealth Bank of Australia to become the first major bank to launch its Buy Now Pay Later service. CBA will be the first of the big four to offer a Buy Now Pay Later service of its own as the bank seeks to align itself with the consumer shifts away from traditional credit cards. Because your millennials, your Gen Alpha and, and everyone that's younger than millennials, they're moving away from traditional credit cards and using these services like Afterpay and ZipPay and Alipay and so on. And what's happened to Ali, Afterpay and ZipPay since that has happened, since the CBA announcements, 
Buy Now Pay Later platform, Afterpay lost 2.7% today to $108 following a 1.7% fall on Thursday. Its rival Zip was also down 2.1%. So I liken this to like your Uber, right? So there was a taxi industry and then when Uber came in, it disrupted the taxi industry. Here you had a buy now pay later providers, Zip pay, Afterpay, Alipay, and then your banks come in and disrupt it because they can offer cheaper rates and people you know, already bank with Commonwealth Bank, so they might as well go there. So now it's going to be a race to the bottom. Who can provide the most attractive rates? Moving on, international Qantas workers to get government funded wage subsidy after JobKeeper ends. Now, the reason I put this in is for those that are thinking, oh, airline stocks are cheap. Just remember, Airline stocks are full of debt right now because they've been grounded for a year. And historically, from let's say 2014 to 2020, airlines were making profits and then using those profits to buy back stock and prop up the share price. So now that they've been grounded for a year, and not having any cash reserves or having very limited cash reserves, now they need wage subsidies by the federal government. So which means to tell me that they're full of debt. So if you're looking at investing in any of these airlines, just be wary of that. And finally, to finish the session, why in the world would you own bonds when? So it's a letter from Ray Dalio. TLDR, we're going to go to a fantastic summary by Case Bitcoin, uh, given that it's a 20 minute article. But he says in the article that the economics of investing in bonds and most financial assets has become stupid. That's because typically there's a 60-40 portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds. And that's what people generally talk about when they say, you know, a 60-40 portfolio, which is very common. However, Ray Dalio is saying it's stupid because the yields on those bonds are say 2%. When you have a 2% yield, but a cost of capital, which to me is the money supply, so the M2 money supply, if you have a 2% yield and a cost of capital in Australia in, of 12.9%, then you're still down 10.9% overall if you're buying bonds. So you're actually losing 10.9% of your purchasing power by buying bonds. In America or the US specifically, that's even worse. So you have, let's say these bonds are 2% and then the cost of capital is 25% because they printed 25% more dollars in the last 12 months. So two minus 25, they're still down 23% of their purchasing power if they go ahead and buy bonds. So he's saying move into other assets. He notes that there are over 75 trillion in US debt assets of varying maturities. So if the biggest money manager in the world is saying that there's these bonds, these, these government bonds, these US debt assets, and it's worth $75 trillion and move out of those assets is what he's essentially saying, that's $75 trillion that needs to go somewhere. Think about that. Bitcoin is a $1 trillion market cap. And he is pointing towards Bitcoin in the article. It's a $1 trillion market cap with the potential to have up to $75 trillion of the bond market come in. What happens to the price of Bitcoin? Anyway, he ends the article with a note on how policymakers may try and stem the flow out of bonds and into hard assets. And he also mentions how the optimal portfolio for these times is no longer the traditional 60-40 stock bond mix. He believes a well-diversified portfolio of non-debt and non-dollar assets, <coughs> Bitcoin, along with a short cash position is preferable to a traditional stock bond mix that is heavily skewed to US dollars. And he's absolutely right, guys. He this advice. He's one of the greatest money managers in the world, and he's telling you to stay the hell away from assets that do not provide a yield that exceeds the cost of capital. That is all we have time for today, folks. If you have any topics that you would like us to discuss for next week, please leave your comments below. Otherwise, we will see you next week. Don't forget to like and subscribe.